The year is 1981, and nobody knows it yet, but this is a time of change in NASCAR. Already the wide cars of the 1970s have begun to get narrowed and shrunk, and many of the legends that dominated the sport for the last decade are reaching the end of their glory days. The 1981 Daytona 500 falls in the firing line of this transition period, and for the man who has dominated this race for years, it's his last hurrah at greatness. Teddy, the great southern stock car driver, coming around now will take the checkered flag for his an unprecedented third Daytona 500 triumph. Onto the trioval, and the Petty Blue flies under the checkered flag, winner of the 15th annual Daytona 500. There's the checker out and the STP Dodge of Richard Petty has won the Daytona 500. Richard Petty is now. Daytona Speedway, I'm Ken Squire, and welcome to America's Great Race. On a windy day at Daytona, 42 drivers line up on the pit lane. The pole winner is Bobby Allison, driving for the same team and car number that won last year's event, the fastest 500 ever. However, they aren't driving the same manufacturer. The team has swapped to a Pontiac due to the aerodynamic deficiencies that the Oldsmobiles face this year. In 1981, the cars have been narrowed up compared to last year, making handling much more difficult. And already in the twin 125s, two cars have lost it and flown upside down due to the handling. And while both drivers escaped relatively unscathed, the fear is that this will persist with even gustier winds today. With all this in mind, the Allison team has chose to run the Lamar body that Pontiac provides, giving them an incredible aerodynamic advantage. Most teams have opted to Buick's this race due to their aerodynamic advantage but still face a handling problem in the draft with their boxy rear window. The 2018 ran by Harry Rainier, however, picked up on the Lamar rear end design first and have an incredible aerodynamic advantage. After this race, though, the rule will be changed to stop this from happening, but for now, Allison can run this Pontiac. Starting in second is Darrell Waltrip, driving for Junior Johnson. In only their second race together, this soon-to-be legendary tandem are about to take their Buick and try and win the Daytona 500. Waltrip is one of 14 Buicks in the field, and of the six manufacturers in the field, they have the most, with Pontiac in second with 11 cars. Even Richard Petty is in a Buick, even though in recent years Petty has shied away from the Chrysler in the 500, running Oldsmobiles in the recent seasons, he still was approached in the offseason by the car company about running their product once again. However, after a test session where Petty drove a Dodge Murata, it was found to be way off pace and Petty decided to go with the Buick. With wind gusts of over 40 miles an hour, the field goes green. Within a lap, they are reaching speeds of over 190 miles an hour. Allison establishes himself out front with fellow Alabama gang member Neil Bonnet in second. Quickly though, Darrell Waltrip catches up and pushes Bonnet by Allison for the first lead change of the day. But quickly, Allison in the one car of Buddy Baker passes back by. The next lap, Baker and Bonnet work past Allison again, and the reigning 500 champ is trying to beat the car that he won with last year. But after a lap, Bonnet passes by again, and in the opening seven laps, the action is intense. Baker again passes back by, and Bonnet falls back. The Alabama gang roars back to the front and starts the lap past lap cars already. Bonnet on lap 8 dares fate and dives to the inside as the front pack grows to 12 cars. On lap 11, Buddy Arrington faces issues and has to pit. Even though they are outnumbered, Ford is still showing some strength with the legendary Wood Brothers. And by lap 14, reigning cup champion Dale Earnhardt has now moved to second. Soon he takes the lead. Meanwhile, Darrell Waltrip is beginning the trail smoke and is starting to slow. 
Bondit gets Earnhardt back as Ronnie Thomas in the 25 is now facing issues. On lap 18, the first crash occurs. The number 39 of Blackie Wangren hits the front stretch wall and goes into the infield. The sod rips off the right front the rest of the way and brings the field under caution. The leaders zip down the pit lane and make their first stops of the race. Meanwhile, the 11 team is now having more issues as the car is falling off the jack. They get it up and Mulcher beats the pace car off. However, the team is still working on the car, as when the car fell off the jack, it bent the entire front fender, and the car is also still smoking. The race restarts with Ricky Rudd in the lead. Other young hotshot Terry Labonte runs second to him, and behind them, Allison is cutting through the field and chasing them down. Not long after, Allison slices back and retakes the lead. And on lap 29, three cars all of a sudden report there's broken windshields. The 93 of Don Weddington, the 17 of Glenn Jarrett, and the 1 of Buddy Baker. In the onboard shot on Terry Labonte's car, running in the top 5, they have written in crayon, Hi Justin. This is a message to Terry's weak old son, who is at home watching with Terry's family. Harry Gant is now facing issues on track and has to pit from the top 5. The team realizes he's having an ignition issue, and now Bonnet leads again as the Alabama gang continues to dominate. By lap 40, Richard Petty is riding just inside the top 10, as young guns and veterans continue to fight between one another. The one thing the new car appears to have done is made the racing better. Already 15 lead changes in the first 50 laps, and while riding on board with Terry Labonte, his engine lets go, and dumps oil all over the racetrack. And as he pulls into the garage, this happens. Running with the leaders, Oh, is trouble in car number 23, has spun off up in turn number four, up by the tunnel. Jeffrey Bodine goes flying into the infield from hitting the oil, and rams to a parked vehicle. People scattered, but miraculously nobody was seriously injured. And the caution is out, and once again, the leaders pit. In the pit lane, Allison and Bonnet get parked in, and can't get out of their stalls, losing valuable time and positions. And under the caution, Dale Earnhardt again takes the lead ahead of the 28 and 21. Instantly on the restart, they fly by Earnhardt, and Allison continues to work with Bonnet. Bonnet and Allison again begin the battle as Earnhardt, in third, watches on. Soon after the restart though, the 7 of Bruce Hill hits the wall and brings out the caution. The race goes back green again, and lap cars race hard with Allison and Earnhardt as Winnington tries to stay in front. Soon after, Jeffrey Bodine comes back out on track and continues his race after the infield excursion. Bonnet, who has fallen back, is trying desperately to get back to Allison at the front, making daredevil moves. In five laps, Bonnet gains 13 spots and starts pushing Buddy Baker towards the front. Soon they clear it, Allison, and Bonnet comes to the point. Allison now moves to second and is stalking Bonnet once more. He passes him back and retakes the lead. The two keep swapping the lead back and forth as they approach halfway, and as they dice through traffic now, the winds keep daring the cars in the wrecks, and Bonnet continues to peak for the lead. Right before green flag pit stops, though, Kelly Arbrose spins out after cutting a tire and brings out the caution. The field pits once again, and many of the leaders take tires and fuel. Meanwhile, A.J. Foyt ran the stop sign at the end of pit road, and is being penalized a lap, and he is fuming. As he's leaving the pit lane, he shakes his fist at the stop sign man at the end of the pit exit. While all this is going on, Johnny Rutherford comes in before the restart and has a clutch problem. And on the restart, Bill Elliott holds the lead, but quickly is passed by Allison Bonnet once again. At halfway, Bonnet leads now over Earnhardt, and Allison is in third. Still, over 10 cars are racing for the lead, which was a rarity for the time at halfway. In the lap after halfway, Allison blows by for the lead. After a couple laps, they shuffle more and more, with Baker taking the point, and the sun starts to peek out as the leaders continue to fight. Waltrip is now third, but his car has been smoking now for over 100 laps. Meanwhile, Parsons comes in, and is facing serious overheating issues, prematurely ending his race. The race is still between the 21 and 28, however, and Jimmy Means now comes in with engine issues as well. The race for the lead is still tight, and no one can get away. And the rumor for why this might be the case is due to NASCAR possibly being way more lenient in tech inspection this morning to try and make sure the field stays caught up with that 28 Pontiac Le Mans body. As the race progresses past halfway, Dare Waltrip 
finally has the smoke catch up to him. The car is slow, and his competitiveness is gone. Then all of a sudden, Neil Bonnet suddenly pits, and this allows for Allison to start running away from the rest of the field. Allison is now booking it with 80 to go, and Baker can't keep up in second. And as the sun starts baking the track, the wind is still gusting at nearly 40 miles an hour. And all of a sudden, Bonnet's car slowed, and it's realized that his spoiler is starting to fall off. Allison's apparent only competition now has fallen off the pace, and Bonnet has to pull into the garage. Allison, with less than 70 to go, has now built a 3 plus second lead as the rest of the top five draft together. Baker, Earnhardt, Rudd, Petty, and now David Pearson is the top six, with all five of them drafting together. Allison soon with 68 to go comes flying down the pit lane and Baker follows. The rest of the leaders pit and now the 25 is stalled in the fastest part of the pit lane. The only two leaders not to pit the next lap after Allison were Richard Petty and David Pearson. Petty pits three laps after Allison and David Pearson stays out once again to take the lead. After he finally cycles out, it comes out to Allison still leading and the top five staying relatively unchanged. Through lap traffic, however, the top five chase back down Allison, and Baker gets a huge run on a lap car. Baker steals the lead from Allison with 60 to go, and soon after, Pearson has smoke erupting from his car and has to pit. Allison and Baker still race with Allison ahead now, entering the final 50 laps, and Petty now has worked his way to third behind the battle for the lead. Harry Gant has worked his way into this situation as a lap down car, but sits in the middle of them all. Petty rides behind the fight between Baker and Allison, where Buddy, in the one car, now pulls ahead. Gant now flares by Baker, carving the way for Allison to go back by for the lead, and now working down the 40 to go, the leaders are in more lap traffic. Baker still stalks Allison for the lead, and now the top three are separating from Ricky Rudd in fourth and Dale Earnhardt in fifth. The last stops of the day are looming, and mechanical failures are getting more and more. With 35 to go, Baker leads for the 46th lead change of the race. And Bobby Allison comes back by for the 47th lead change. Through this battle, Dale Earnhardt catches up and is now racing at the front for the win. But Allison once again starts running away, and Earnhardt is slowing ever so slightly. Petty, meanwhile, has decided to sit back and wait for the leaders to battle, expecting the same result in the 1979 Daytona 500 in this scenario. And coming up to the last 25 laps, the field starts the pit cycle. Coming to 27 to go, Allison pulls down low and starts running extremely slow to the pit lane and loses multiple positions. Petty stays out an extra lap as Bobby comes in to an unexpected crew and has realized that the car ran out of gas before expected. And now they need to refire the engine, losing even more precious time. They change two tires and fill it with gas in 15 seconds. Petty and Rudd continue to stay out, coming to 25 laps to go. And then Rudd now comes in the lap after coming to 24 to go. Petty stays out another lap, and Rudd takes two tires and fuel as well. Petty finally comes in with 23 laps to go, four laps after Bobby Allison. He rolls to a stop. The pit crew is in the business. Dale Inman, the crew chief on this car. Maurice Petty, his brother, directing the traffic here as they go to work on the rocks. And they're not changing tires. A change of pace here for the Petty crew. They're only adding gasoline. What strategy? We'll see how it works. Only 6.8 seconds. He not only beats Bobby Allison coming into the pit lane, but he beats him by 9 seconds on their pit stops. Dale Inman made a miraculous call to put about 10 to 15 seconds on Bobby Allison with 23 to go. The question is now, can they make it to the finish on this set of tires? Many teams think he can but Inman has been measuring the wear all weekend, and he knows the real answer. They can. The other question is, can Petty make it on gas? Since he's out front by himself, he's burning more gas, but he has only 23 laps, which is about 58 miles, to go. Bobby Allison, meanwhile, who's fallen back to fifth, has chased back down the second through fourth group from four seconds back, and now needs to close 10 seconds on Petty. 17 to go. The gap is 9.8 seconds. With 10 laps to go, the lead is 8.6 seconds, and Allison is not closing fast enough. Dale Inman is working diligently to tell him the speed and pace that Petty needs to go. With lap traffic ahead, Petty is going to have to work for his 7th Daytona 500. With 8 to go, the gap isn't closing. 
Petty hasn't had the fastest car, nor the most notable or most dominant performance, but with six to go, Richard Petty is about to win a 500 by doing what he does best, outlasting and outsmarting the competition. Ricky Rudd has now roared up the third, and Petty now has 10 miles to go, three to go, and the interval is 7.6. Now it's down to 6.9, two to go, and it's 6.5, not enough time. But Allison is still charging, doing everything he can. To the white flag, it's home three. One lap to go for Richard Petty, who looks like he's on his way to his 100th career win. I'll tell you, I want to be there the day he wins to the crowd up on their feet. One of the most beloved race drivers in the history of the sport, going down into turn number two. You are watching an incredible moment in the history of motorsport. Here is a man winning the most difficult, the most prestigious stock car race there is. For the seventh time, Bobby Allison. A sort of win situation. The sort of strategy he pulled here is like sinking about a 90-foot punt to win the uh, U.S. Open by one hole. Out of turn number four, Richard Petty holding on to that lead like a hammerhead shark. Here he comes, coming down, seeking out. And is he slowing down? Is he running out of fuel? He's coming to the line slowly, but he takes the checkered flag. With Stan Barrett's crash after the flag, the Daytona 500 is over. Richard Petty wins his 7th 500 in his 193rd Cup Series race. The emotion is overflowing. The team is ecstatic. No other man up to this point besides Kill Yarbrough has won the 500 more than once. But Petty now has 7. In victory lane, Petty is once again happy. And the man behind the master strategy, Dale Enman, seems the most emotional. We're coming to you live from Daytona, and right now they're prepping for the Grand Slam of Tennis, McEnroe against Villas later today. Here you'll see it live on CBS. Right now we're getting ready to go back to Victory Lane where the celebration continues for Richard Petty. His first cousin, who's been with him for every race but two in his entire career, is standing by with Ned Jerry. That's Dale Inman, seven-time champion, seven-time winner of the Daytona 500. Dale, what a brilliant move you fellas made out here. Well, Ned, we kind of had it planned for a while. Our radios weren't working too good, and uh, there's so much wind in the car, and then the, the other guys kind of slipped in on us before we was ready for them, and uh, we, we'd had it planned that way. If it had been a car, we'd have had the race, but uh, it was far down the line, Ned, that we'd had it figured that way for a good bit, and we was hoping we could catch them changing tires. Richard said that uh, he was not concerned about the tires. I'm sure that you had measured them all along and knew exactly how far you could go. There was no tire wear at, at all in the 125 mile races. There was no, there was no tire wear all week. And uh, we had projected that we could go uh, right at a full race without changing left side rubber. Dale winning this race goes back a long way. Just what happened here today was not the total story. We worked our rears off and they had to get ready for this race. and. Uh, a lot of families have sacrificed because we, we've uh, worked night and day to get ready. When you say sacrifice, what do you mean? Sometimes you have to put your family aside. It seems like to get the car ready. Well, I'll tell you, that this crew really knows how to do that. I know how appreciative you folks are for the, the dedication that the crew put in the effort in bringing this car into Vickard Lane. Congratulations again. Dad. Thank you, Ned. Richard doesn't know it yet, but Dale Inman does. After this race, Dale would leave Penny Enterprises for the first time ever in his career and go work for the Rod Osterland number 2 car. Not only was this Richard Petty's last Daytona 500 win, but he and Dale Inman would never win a race together again.